This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Tina Cassidy, who is the Chief Marketing Officer at GBH, formerly WGBH, and is also the author of numerous books, including this one most recently, which is called Mr. President, How Long Must We Wait? Alice Paul, Woodrow Wilson and the Fight for the Right to Vote. Also the author of uh, a book, Jackie After O, oh, One Remarkable Year When Jackie Kennedy Onassis Defied Expectations and re Rediscovered Her Dream. And also the author of Birth, The Surprising History of How We Are Born. And so I hope we can spend most of the time talking about this book, Birth, which although it came out, I guess now 15 years ago or so, is still a remarkably timely book. And I think at the time it was really, I don't know, the only comprehensive history of human birth that had been written. I think when you, at the beginning of the book, you mentioned that you were frustrated when you went out there and tried to find books on the history of birth and you, you couldn't find anything recent. And, and I guess the question is, you know, we've got histories of everything. I mean, we've got histories of cod, we've got histories of milk, we've got histories of, you know, salt, we've got histories of, of all these things. And, and, you know, birth is such, is such an essential and important part of everything uh, human. And all of us have, have been through it and we've been doing it for an awfully long time. So why do you suppose it is that it has not been well studied by historians, you know, by academics, by, by social scientists and so forth? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on this podcast. I love the premise of the podcast. And I think it is really important for all of us to get outside of our silos and think about the intersectionalities of different disciplines. So I love that. Birth is certainly one of those interdisciplinary realms. And as you think about it, the factors that play in birth include social issues like patriarchy, misogyny, medicine, science, history, right? So there's uh, culture, religion. <laughs> so all of these factors show up in that. And, and you're right. I, when I wrote this book, uh, which came out in 2006, there had not been a comprehensive history of childbirth written in 50 years. And that book, that previous book from 50 years earlier had been written by a British obstetrician. So you can imagine that he certainly had a particular perspective on childbirth. And uh, it was quite telling. That book title was called Eternal Eve. And the idea is that, you know, goes back to the Bible that, you know, the original sin came from women and that women were meant to suffer the curse of Eve, which means, you know, that bear the pain throughout their life, whether that was in childbirth or another matter. So certainly not the perspective that I had as a, a mom in my 30s at that time. So, you know, I, I was a journalist as well and, and really wanted to kind of bring a different sort of discipline to looking at the history, like what, what are the scientific facts? You know, is, is that science evidence-based or why is it that Every culture and every generation has a different way of having a baby when it's the same ancient physiological process. So these are all sort of questions and, and approaches that part of me writing this book. Yeah, I think at the end of the book, you say that the book is about, to some extent, the conflict between nature and obstetrics. And I, I mean, obviously, it's much more complicated than that. But there does seem to be this narrative of the medicalization of the birthing process and you know, when we think of medicine, we think of sickness. And throughout the book, there's this theme that giving birth, it's not a sickness. Pregnancy is not an illness. And yet the medical profession has wanted to take over this activity. And I think you and I were born probably close to the same era. And our mothers were giving birth in an era when it was, I guess, peak hospitalization. Is that, is that, is that probably true, that, at least yeah, in the U.S.? I mean, hospitalization numbers have only have sort of stayed at the same level since our mothers gave birth in hospitals, assuming that's where your mother did it. But I think it was, it was even more medicalized then. And, uh, you know, where my mother, for example, was unconscious when she gave birth to me. And that was the desired at that time. And it's kind of unfathomable to think that women would want that today. And I think most women don't. But again, it gets back to this point. Well, like, why did people think that was the right thing to do then? Right. My grandmother before her 
was part of an earlier experimental wave around twilight sleep, which was a mixture of morphine and, and scopolamine, where you were completely snowed under you know, scopolamine being a way that, you know, you would you would be snowed under but wouldn't remember anything. So kind of bizarre to think about giving birth to a baby and not remembering it and then waking up whenever with this, you know, bundle in your arms, you know, really, really pretty sad. And I, I just wanted to explore why that was, you know, and and why we put that faith in medicine to be telling us in the moment, you know, we have your best interests in mind. There's all this science here that we're using to support our approach to how we think you should be giving birth. And then you wait a little while, you know, a decade or a generation. And it was like, wow, that was really bad. And yet childbirth is consistently the same everywhere all over the globe, right? And even today, or 10 years ago, you could look at how people gave birth in the United States versus how women gave birth in the Netherlands or somewhere in Africa, and they there would be cultural differences there. And of course, the women in those cultures would think, well, this is the way to do it. This is the best way. This is how this is our approach, right? And so also just really fascinated by the way culture plays. And I will say that, you know, the way birth typically happens in any given culture is often a reflection of that culture. So, you know, the the Dutch have had historically one of the highest levels of home birth anywhere in the world, even today. And if you think about the level of equality that Dutch women have in in that society, it, it basically shows that people have faith in women giving birth and that women have faith in themselves to give birth at home. And it hasn't been quite as medicalized. Uh, whereas in America, you know, we're sort of a culture obsessed with technology and the tort system <laughs> and insurance regulations and all of these other things that really don't have anything to do with physiology. So you can see how that has played out with us having things like a 30% C-section rate, which is a statistic that hasn't really moved very much in 20 years, sadly. Well, so, I mean, childbirth is a natural process and every mammal, you know, has live births. But humans are unique in a lot of ways, not just because we have culture, which plays a huge role in you know, how we do everything. But also there's something about human birth that is different. I mean, we have our physiologies lead to many more complications for live births than it does for almost any other mammal. Uh, so what is it that's unique about human birth? Yeah, well, one thing that makes us different from many other mammals is that we walk on two feet. We're bipedal and, you know, many other mammals are walk on all fours. So their hip structure, if you think about the closest living relatives in the mammal world, you know, apes, chimpanzees, monkeys, they are bipedal, but also use their front legs, right? So they're not completely walking the way we do. And it means that their pelvis is wider and, you know, Monkey babies are able to literally drop down the pelvic chute very easily and, you know, they dive straight down and out they come. A, a monkey can give birth in like two minutes, which is really awesome for the mother monkeys. <laughs> we don't have it quite the same way because we do walk upright. Our pelvis is narrower. It means that the baby has to twist on its descent in order to fit well through the pelvic chute. And it means it takes longer, but it obviously doesn't mean it's impossible because 4 million babies are born in America every year. So we know it's happening, right? And our species have, has not become extinct. So the question really is like, what are the things that get in the way of a human baby being born vaginally? And, you know, there, there are lots of things. I would say birth might not be as statistically dangerous as the medical community has led us to believe. Yeah, how, how dangerous was it, let's say, in, I don't know, hunt, hunter-gatherer society or, you know, pre-modern societies? How dangerous was it? I'm not thinking about kind of the early modern period where everyone had, you know, there's a lot of rickets and malnutrition, but sort of in prehistoric society, how dangerous was childbirth to a typical mother? Well, it's a good question. And we don't totally know because we don't have records from that time, right? This is prehistory. But what I will say is that even if, if when you start to examine, let me go back 200 years, how, what were the reasons behind obstructed births or, you know, babies not being able to be born vaginally? 
there were a lot of kind of man-made issues that got in the way. For example, women wearing corsets created physical deformities, constricting the abdomen, like her bones were permanently altered and weren't they weren't able to open up during a typical childbirth. So like that's one example, right? Another would be unclean birthing practices, whether it was a midwife using unwashed hands or a doctor using unwashed hands for examinations and not knowing how germs were spread. Many mothers and babies died from situations like that. And of course, you know, there were situations where, you know, you could have like a legitimately obstructed birth. Perhaps, you know, an umbilical cord would be wrapped around a baby's neck or or something like that, or the baby just died in utero and there was no way to get the baby out in time and it poisoned the mother. Things like that can happen, but I would say that it's a very, very small number, you know, like a fraction of a percent that that sort of thing happens. The World Health Organization, even today, will say that a C-section is necessary in less than 10% of the cases, and that's probably a conservative number or a liberal number, I should say. The real number is probably closer to 5%, and yet our C-section numbers are at 30%. So there's a gap there where you know we are kind of intervening just to be safe or out of convenience more than is necessary. There's a section in your book called Too Posh to Push. I think a lot of that is elective, right? A lot of that is just purely a matter of convenience or aesthetics. But from the medical perspective, do, do you think that the the doctors use this term necessary sort of more subjectively? I mean, it, there's no clear line where something is necessary or non-necessary, right? Do you think that the, the, the fact that this, what's considered necessary across different cultures and different time periods makes you wonder you know, whether or not there exists any objective criteria for necessary for some of the medical interventions? Sure. I, there's so much to unpack with this question, and it's a really good one. You know, maybe if we start going back a century when doctors began taking births away from midwives, that's a really crucial period in history that it has shaped very much where we are today. So, you know, midwives were the birth attendants basically since the dawn of time, right? And, and, A midwife wouldn't necessarily be a professionally trained woman. It would just be, could be, you know, someone's mother, aunt, neighbor from the village, someone who had probably given birth herself and learned from other women who had attended births, right? And that started to change around 100 years ago with the advent of pain relief drugs, where Queen Victoria was among the first to say that she wanted and needed this. And only a doctor could be smart enough to be able to deliver that pain relief. So that's why birth then began to move from the home to the hospital. I remember you described her, was it uh, Prince Leopold, I guess, was the first one she had with pain relief? That's right. Yes. And it's interesting because birth trends typically start like other fashion trends, right? With celebrities or well-known people, women of high status, and certainly the queen saying, oh, I'm going to partake in, you know, it was basically ether to have a baby. That became a whole big thing. And so when men in the medical field decided that birth was a good business to be in, they really didn't know anything about it. They had never been allowed to attend births. Even in medical school, the woman would have to be completely covered with a sheet and they weren't allowed to look at what was going on. And they had never experienced it themselves. And there was nothing proper in the literature about it. And so they were literally fumbling around in the dark. But because they had, you know, a degree, a pedigree that said we're men, and it was all men at the time, women weren't allowed to be doctors, they weren't allowed into medical school, that we have the authority and we know more. And that really wasn't the case. And sadly, a lot of information that had been passed down throughout time, midwifery information was was lost, a lot of the art and the craft. And so, you know, I, I think I think it just shows you that, you know, as a profession evolves, much can be gained. And I certainly think, you know, there's so much life-saving capability in obstetrics today that is amazing. But we also need to think about, you know, what has been lost as well. You know, the human touch, having someone attend your, attend a woman throughout her birth experience is going to have a much different hormonal reaction 
that's going to make childbirth easier, faster, easier, you know, less painful. That is scientifically proven. And that's a very different scenario than what happens in the obstetrical ward of a hospital, right, where a nurse will come in and check on you and leave and you're left with like, you know, blinking lights and beeping noises and strangers. And if you're in a teaching hospital, a bunch of residents show up and you're like, who's this? What's happening? And it can actually stall your birth because your hormones are saying like, this is not a safe environment. You know, it's that that mammal instinct kicks in. So there's just so many interesting factors at play. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. The part about how, you know, when you're giving birth, it's a very vulnerable position, right? And so all mammals want to be in a safe place. They want to feel safe from predators. They want to make sure that they're not going to be attacked. And so having some familiar surroundings with some familiar people with emotional support can reduce stress levels and facilitate the birthing process. And yeah, it does seem awfully strange. You know, you take someone to this completely new place with all these new people, with all these strangers and people coming and going, and it doesn't seem optimal. But I want to ask about the profession of midwifery. It's not like these were amateurs. I mean, these were people who had a lot of tacit knowledge, a lot of kind of collective knowledge, a lot of wisdom that had been developed over the centuries. Maybe in retrospect, some of it seemed bogus, right? The use of different potions and so forth. But, you know, quite a bit of it no, was no stuff more that... bogus than things that doctors were using as <laughs> exactly, well, right? Exactly, yeah. right, right. But all that knowledge was more or less suppressed and stripped away. And in fact, I think you argue that the profession was prohibited from, was not only was it banned, but it was also, they were denied any kind of training that would allow them to improve or add to their stock of knowledge. Yeah, it's it's interesting to think about the time about a century ago, again, when we had waves of immigrants coming to America from Europe, and many of them, you know, there were midwives among them. There were also granny midwives in the Black community in the South, you know, where there was zero, you know, medical or sort of official care for women who were enslaved. You know, the the thinking was, well, if these women, these midwives can't read, then they can't be smart, right? You know, it, it, maybe they could read, they just spoke another language, or they had their own ways of communicating. So it's it was this like, sort of patriarchal, condescending way of judging someone's knowledge, you know, the and then that combined with this idea that the medical community knew that this was a business that they could and should own, that they they just started systematically trying to shut down midwifery. So they they created laws that, you know, made it impossible, uh, you know, whether it's very, very similar to some of, you know, some of the issues around voting rights, right? Like, let's make it really hard. Let's, you know, tack on fees and do literacy tests and, and things like that. So, you know, little by little, it did become almost, you know, a, a defunct system. I think that the natural birth movement in the 60s and 70s helped to, you know, breathe new life into midwifery. And it's it's definitely made a resurgence in the last 20 years. It's become much more of an activist kind of community where they know that they're fighting not just for their jobs, but for the women in their community and for an alternative to hospital births. You recount some pretty scary statistics where the fatality rate in hospitals was considerably higher than the fatality rate for home births in kind of the early 20th century. And and yet it's interesting that the people who went to the hospitals in some cases were the wealthy, right? And the people who had access to hospitals, but in other cases, it was the very poor who were going into these hospitals. It it doesn't seem like there was a clear correlation between wealth and, you know, where you gave birth. So in the South, right, where you had poorer people, they had a lot more in the way of home births. But then, you know, sometimes in the cities, it was the prostitutes and the uh, destitute that wound up going into these laying in institutions. So was there a time when the people who actually had more wealth were the ones that had poorer outcomes because they were seeking out this medical attention, which was more harmful than good? That's a really great question. The women who were wealthy had access to doctors who could administer pain relief in the hospital. That was the magic combo, right? Like you, the women didn't just want to go to the hospital to have another place to give birth. They did it because they wanted to buy pain relief. So obviously those would be upper-class women who could afford that. 
But, you know, these were also considered women who maybe weren't as sturdy, right? They were, you know, think about fainting couches and corsets and not eating a a proper diet or getting out into the sunshine. That was a very different group of women from, you know, the ones working the field who were healthy and strong and were getting their vitamin D from the sunshine. Very different kind of (laughs) scenario. I think we're also talking about slightly different overlapping eras as well. So if you think about, you know, the very early hospitals, like in the early 1800s, for example, whether it was in France or New York City, those would be places that you just you didn't want to go to. They were really like institutions. So, yes, the absolute destitute, maybe people who did not have homes or couldn't afford care in any, any other setting would end up there. But that evolved, you know, if you, after Queen Victoria is like, yeah, hospital births with ether. This is this is awesome. It attracted a different kind of person, but it was also a different kind of hospital. I was wondering if you could just tell us a bit more about how the medical profession sort of, you know, took over the, the birthing process. And I noticed I didn't say, you know, how the birthing process became more more scientific because it didn't seem like the practices that were increasingly implemented were backed by, you know, scientific analysis or scientific studies. It was more sort of a, a cultural belief in the importance of the medical profession and maybe some politics and behind the scenes lobbying for different legislative protections. What were some of the, the kind of motivations behind this kind of medicalization? Well, money, definitely. The market share, you know, that was the main driving force that got involved in childbirth. Also, the urbanization in America was another big factor, right? You had lots of people in a condensed area. And so to think about how you could standardize practices, whether it was like house calls or bringing women into hospitals, you know, that that was part of it as well. I think one other really important piece here that you mentioned was around how medicine ended up practicing with women. I think, you know, I don't know, practice is really not an accidental word, right? It actually, they were practicing. They didn't, they were trying this and they were trying that. Women were cheap subjects. They weren't respected. You know, I think there are lots of people who who believe that women still aren't terribly respected in the birth room today in hospital settings because they're women. And that is probably even more true for women of color. And there, there are lots of statistics to back that up. You know, there's another complicating factor here, which is that even in more modern times, uh, there are a lot of ethical issues involved in conducting scientific studies on the unborn and, you know, on on maternal health. So it's not just the mom saying, OK, I'll opt into the study, but, you know, you you have another life that you're dealing with as well. So it's the ethics of ethics around it are, are challenging for to do really big studies. A lot of it is like retrospective studies looking at things that have happened in the past. But I think, you know, so much of it really is around like, do people care? Like, do we care about outcomes for mothers and babies? And if so, we need to invest in that. You know, it, it's a parallelism of women's health in general, you know, that most of the medical research has been done on and for men, whether it's for like heart disease or stroke. And then the assumption is, oh, we'll just apply it to women. Well, women's biology is very different. So I think, you know, in the last 10 to 20 years, I think medicine has really woken up to this, that women's health is very specific and we and we need to look at it and, and treat it in, in a different way and and respect that, that it deserves its own disciplines, right? So I think that that's happening more and more, but that has been one of the major impeditives. And even today, you can find really outmoded obstetrical practices still happening because somebody was taught that in medical school 30 or 40 years ago, and it's okay. I mean, it was taught in medical school. That must make it fine. The science hasn't always (laughs) kept up, you know, with the times. Right. You have a whole chapter on pain relief, and I found this to be a fascinating topic because pain has been in the news quite a bit with the rise and and fall of kind of opiates. Right? And, and pain is not something which is objective, really, at its core. There's obviously an element which is, but there's so much around expectation and around kind of how we interpret pain and how we think about it. And we see the kind of use of pain relief differ across time periods and even across, across cultures. And I went in recently for a, um, 
colonoscopy. And I'd read Martha Nussbaum had written an essay about this. And so, and I found out that in Europe, they never use anesthesia. In America, it's like 99% anesthesia. So when I went into the doctor and asked, I said, look, I don't want any anesthesia. They spent hours trying to convince me that I needed to use anesthesia. And I said, well, look, if, if nobody in Holland is using it and they're fine, like, why do I need, what do I need? And they did everything they could to try and make me take the anesthesia. And finally, I managed to convince them not to do it. And it was fine. There was no pain. It was no big deal. And when I tell my friends who've been through this, they're incredulous. They can't believe it because like, why would you question the doctors? Well, I'm so curious how that story ends. Like what was your doctor's mind changed at the end of it? Was he like, yeah, I guess that did go fine. What, why are we doing this? I don't know whether the doctors think about it that much. I think that the, the anesthesia is so standard, standard protocol. And, and of course, it generates a lot of revenue for the, the medical institutions. And maybe they've just had some bad experiences. Maybe some people can't deal with it. And so the patients become easier to handle. But I don't know whether they, the doctors really question it. I think it's just once something becomes a norm or you learn it in medical school, it just becomes standard practice. That's really true. Yeah, it's a it is a process. It's an industry, right? It's not patient centric. It's sort of doctor or hospital centric. And and that's a shame. So the dynamic between, say, an obstetrician today and a woman who's giving birth, there's a bit of a, a power dynamic there. How is that power dynamic changing? Is it changing? It's really interesting. I don't know if it has changed. I think it has the veneer of change to it. You know, when my first son was born, I had a female obstetrician and I was really proud of myself for that. I thought, okay, she's going to get it. She's going to be, you know, up on, she had kids herself. She's going to be, you know, really empathetic and understanding in a way that a male doctor never could. And didn't really end up that way. And I thought, you know, it took me a while to process why that could be. Well, she went to a traditional medical school that and similar training to probably your colonoscopy doctor, right? <laughs> it's like, this is how you do it. And you don't question it. You know, hospital systems also have a lot of hierarchy and and politics and, and things like that that go on. So I, I think, you know, I would say the veneer of change is there, but there's probably a lot more work to do. And I will also say that there are a lot of really amazing male obstetricians out there who are kind of on the front lines of birth activism, talking about really important issues around racism and misogyny and power dynamics and, and all like that. So it's a mixed bag. We talk in the book, you talk a book about a lot of fads and a lot of things that have come and gone. And, you know, it's been 15 years since this book came out. If you were to revise this book now, would there be new fads and trends that you would point to? Do you think that the direction that the book was highlighting towards something more like uh, a natural view of childbirth has continued? Or, I mean, you mentioned the cesarean rates are kind of the same as they were. Has there been kind of some stalling of this movement or has it, has it continued? I think it's gained some momentum. I think that some other things that have happened probably in the last five years is that the activism in the birth community or, you know, among women feeling more empowered, millennial women now especially, is a new factor where, you know, they're not, they're, they're much better consumers. They're shopping around. They're thinking about all of their options. They're not just going to go with, you know, what the generation before them did. And I think that that's really great. Again, every generation has its own way of doing things. I think millennials are also much more proactive about having support. So having a doula, with them, that is a trend that has only increased over time, which has been really great. You know, more of them are considering home birth or having a midwife in a hospital setting. And yet at the same time, you know, some hospitals have completely eliminated their midwifery programs, which which is a shame. So, again, I, I do think it's, it's a little bit of a, of a mixed bag even today. Mm hmm. And you mentioned the presence of fathers in the birthing room, and you, you said that this sort of has mixed impact, right? In a way, it's a good thing because it's good to have sort of a community of supporters and so forth. But you also mentioned that it can sometimes be a little distracting. I was wondering if you could tell us the latest on on that thinking. Yeah. Part of what got me interested in writing this book after I had had my own baby was to talk to my grandmother and my mother and my aunt about, you know, their birth experiences. And my grandmother, who was had her kids right after the Second World War in a hospital setting, you know, of course, men were not allowed. And I think that 
culturally, we moved in more into the, the 60s, where women were kind of pushing that second wave of feminism and saying, like, wait a minute, you know, why don't we have more control uh, of this? If you're going to separate us from our families and put us in the hospital, you know, we're completely cut off. Like, we, we need to have somebody there. And so the compromise was, okay, the dad, right? And of course, it was, there was only a dad. And that became a little bit more acceptable. Not all dads were on board with that. I mean, this was a very new concept. It was pretty radical. Even during the home birth era, dads would not be there. They didn't want to be there. The women didn't need them there. The midwives thought, you're just getting in the way. So it was all fine. I think what happened was it just became like such a necessity so that the woman didn't feel alone, you know, that that basically every hospital had to allow it or else they were going to lose market share. And it's just sad that while it's awesome that dads or, you know, another parent can be there, it's sad that that is often in many places the only person who can be there to support the mom. It is very different from the way birth used to happen, which, you know, the, the word gossip comes from the the original word is God sib, sisters in God. These would be women who would gather around the mother to support her through birth. They'd sit there for hours and they would talk and they would cook and they would knit. And, you know, she would really feel supported by that. I in no way say this to denigrate the presence of, you know, having a dad be there. But I think that women should be allowed more than that. And I also think there are lots of dads who are like not really into it and they should be let off the hook if they don't want to be because there are situations where his stress and anxiety can create more stress and anxiety in the room, which is not great for the mom. Well, one of the stories you tell is the idea of the kind of rise of the germ theory. And one of the reasons that doctors will use to kind of keep other people out of the birthing room is this fear of, of germs. And you describe how... Prior to Semmelweis and Pasteur, one of the main reasons why giving birth in the hospital was so dangerous is because of all the germs and disease that was circulating. And the doctors were really a vector for this. Then we kind of went to the complete opposite extreme where there was this obsession with keeping the environment sterile, so much so that mothers were not allowed to even be with their babies and that they would spray everything with Lysol, including the mother between between feedings and so forth. And, you know, that created problems of its own. One of the things that you didn't talk about much in the book, I think, was, you know, all this stuff about the biome, which I think we've learned quite a bit about in the last 15 years and how important it is for there to be skin on skin contact and breastfeeding and vaginal birth or exposure to the bacteria that is in the vagina. And so do you think that we've made some progress there, that we've kind of backtracked from that extremity? Yeah, I do think so. I think that, you know, research around the human biome has been really important. And I think a lot of people have gotten the message about that. I think, you know, moms have demanded that into skincare hospitals, good hospitals anyway, are encouraging that. You know, even vernix, which is something that people hadn't thought much about before in a hospital setting is now known to be really helpful to protect the baby. So that's that waxy, gooey substance that the baby will be born with. It's kind of white. Um, one thing that you might not know, because it didn't end up in the epilogue of this book, but I, I had went on and had another baby who was born at home with a midwife. And that was a very different experience. And when I had him the midwife just sort of helps lift the baby up and he's covered in all of the vernix. And my immediately my immediate thought was, okay, he's got to get a bath and he's got to get all swaddled and wrapped. And like, that's how you get your baby, right? But she said, no, in fact, we're going to leave the vernix on and massage it into his skin and it's going to help protect him and keep him healthy. Like there's so much good stuff in that. And it's just, it's so interesting to think that something that the midwife valued, and there is now, of course, medical evidence about, was not had not been valued, you know, four years earlier with my with my previous child, who did get the bath and showed up all shiny and clean in his blanket burrito. There are lots of different aspects of birth that are like that. Another one is cutting of the umbilical cord, where you know, typical in a hospital setting, they'll cut it right away. And clamp it, that just seems, you know, safe, efficient, boom, now you can have your baby unhindered, right? But a midwife wouldn't do that. And more and more people are talking about the importance of letting the umbilical cord stop pulsing on its own. 
because the baby's getting so much more awesome oxygen and nutrients through the blood as it's just gone through this stressful situation of being born and will actually help the baby breathe. There's no good reason to cut it except that, you know, the the medical team's moving on. They need to give it a bath. The nurses are off to the next baby, you know. So I, I do think it's good to question all the steps in the process and to constantly be looking at the science. And I will just add even for, you know, whether it's doctors practitioners or even parents going to an evidence-based medical database like the Cochrane Library can be really helpful so that you have the facts that you need looking at big studies, the few that have been done to to know, like, should the cord be cut or not? There is there is lots to read on it. Well, what's interesting is that a lot of the scientific advancements in this area were at least the ideas for these scientific studies came not from within the medical profession, but from kind of, you know, fringe folks, right? I mean, the natural childbirth movement was spearheaded by people who you don't normally think of as being, you know, scientific minded or scientific orientation. It's really more of a spiritual movement, kind of a almost, you know, antinomian movement to some degree. And and yet that's really what drove these scientific inquiries was the, this kind of new age movement that came out of the sixties and seventies, a lot of it. Yes, I think because those were the people who were questioning our culture at the time, right? And there have been generations of women that have questioned the way the previous generation has given birth, right? So they weren't the first ones. I think if you recall earlier, I said that, you know, every generation has its own way of giving birth and every culture is reflected in the way women give birth. If you think about that time, like the hippie generation, right? People were very much thinking about how can we simplify our lives, get back to the earth, do things in a more natural way. You know, we're not wearing makeup, we're not wearing bras, we're not wearing shoes, we're eating brown bread, right? So it was of a piece. If you think about moving into the 80s, this was the era when women really wanted to have it all. So they wanted to be conscious while giving birth, but they didn't want to feel the pain. This was sort of the introduction of the epidural. Right. And now I think women are a little bit more about I want to give birth my way. Things are much more personalized, you know, so it's not as cookie cutter as it as it might have been. Women are trying to be more in control and just in the same way that, like, you know, you put your own monogram on a on a purse. Millennial moms today are saying, you know, they're, they're sort of picking the best of all of the things that are available to them. And in some ways, it's become a little bit of a consumer culture. You know, like I'm going to go hire a doula and I'm going to go hire a night nurse and I'm going to go do prenatal yoga and and all like that. And it's it's really interesting to see how that's playing out. Do you think that that desire for control can sometimes be problematic for a process which is ultimately not something that's easy to control? I mean, isn't, you know, the medical environment is is organized to control that process and runs up against limits. And so, you know, we as individuals might have run into similar limits when it comes to controlling this process. Yes, of course, this has always been true. I mean, I think, you know, women have been and midwives have been thinking about and doctors, how can we control this event that is seemingly beyond our control? And we and we have we've placed time limits on how long it is acceptable to push the Friedman curve is like a real thing where they're like, okay, three hours, time's up. You can't push beyond that. Well, who said? You know, I mean, some of it is ridiculous, you know, but I, I do think that I'll, I'll never forget when I was researching this book, I spent time in, in hospitals and there was a little cartoon posted inside the OB lounge that basically said, you know, when a woman comes in with a birth plan, that's the woman who's going to end up with a C-section, right? Because, you know, the idea is the, the more control you try to get, the, the less control you're going to have in a situation like that. It's interesting to think about, you know, you, you kind of do have to go into your mammal brain and be like, you just give into it, right? And, and stop overthinking because that's when you mess up your flow of hormones or you get scared or anxiety kicks in and, and it changes the the balance of the whole flow. So yeah, control controls hard, but it's not just moms who try to control birth. It's really everybody involved. With the rising C-section rates, there are some segments of the world, like I think wealthy people in Brazil, you cite, where the 
C-section rate is like 90%. Do you think we'll, we'll get to a, a point in time where the process of birth will be completely medicalized? Even though there, we have this rise of natural childbirth, we, we also see this rise. I mean, I, I always wonder, I live in San Francisco, so you know, I think everybody eats organic food, but in fact, it's, it's actually a very small segment of the world. And so you know, where I live, I, I see everybody pursuing something like natural childbirth. But when you look around the rest of the world, you see, uh, say, C-sections rising dramatically. Do you think we'll evolve to a place where pregnancy and labor will, will just be happening in the lab? <laughs> that will, will, be, will be very far removed from this natural process? I mean, I, I certainly hope not. But I, I will say that, you know, just like food, we are creating food in labs, right? And so there will always be a, a part of that culture that wants that scientific approach and feels comforted. And I think that there will always be those who, who rebel against that notion. So it's hard to know exactly if we'll ever be 100% there. It just, it doesn't seem right. And I certainly hope not. But you did say one other thing that is, is worth talking about a little bit more, you know, about how upper class women in Brazil were really going in for C-sections because that was what was popular or trending at the time. It was like this new thing. Oh, you can elect to have a C-section. But where you live, what is, you know, sort of popular and maybe even, you know, posh to use that term is to have a natural birth. Right. So it's very even like regionally cultural. There are women in middle America who don't have access to midwives, who might not have access to organic food, even though there's a farm right down the street. Right. So the way we live in the world and our systems, our industrial systems, our medical systems, uh, our food systems, all of these things have an effect on on outcomes like women might not have a choice whether to have a C-section or not. If there's one hospital within 100 miles and no midwives and the doctor says, I have to schedule you for a C-section because I've got 12 other women giving birth at the same time and this is the only way I can manage it, she doesn't really have a choice. So it is true that there are some women who have chosen to be to have a more scientific because they thought it was fashionable or convenient for them. And there are other women who end up in that situation who didn't want it and didn't have a choice. You know, I'm obviously a, a proponent about choice in that regard. However, you know, a woman feels like they are most comfortable having a baby is the way that they should go. Home birth isn't for everyone. Natural childbirth won't be possible for everyone. But I think as long as women know that they should be asking questions and thinking about what's going to work for them, that that's a really good place to start. Well, you talk about, you know, kind of questioning the, the status quo. And, and I think this book here describes someone who is doing that in a way that ought to be better known. And you talk about Alice Paul and her achievements. Why don't people know who Alice Paul is? First, tell us who Alice Paul was and, and why don't people know about her? I mean, I think most people know about Susan B. Anthony, but very few people know about Alice Paul. I didn't know about Alice Paul before I read this book. Yeah, I didn't know about Alice Paul before I wrote the book as well, which is, it's why I wrote the book. So Alice Paul was a Quaker from New Jersey, and she ended up being one of the leaders of the movement for the 19th Amendment, which granted uh, women the right to vote in 1920. She's also the author of the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, which she wrote in 1923, and which still has not been ratified as part of our Constitution, even though it did pass Congress a while back. So Alice Paul really is is a, a a feminist hero. She's a woman who fought her whole life for women's rights and filed hundreds of bills in Congress to help make the legal system more equitable to women. Why don't we know who she was? Frankly, because she was a woman is really at the root of it. I would say that women's history has been ignored in so many ways. And because a more nuanced answer is that there were two factions in the women's movement at that time. And there was one group that included a lot of those old line suffragists. You know, you mentioned Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and there were others who believed the federal government would never grant women the right to vote. So they should ask each state for permission. And they were doing that in a systematic way. But it was became clear that the southern states were never going to grant women the vote. So Alice Paul came along as, you know, a, a new generation. She was in her 20s and she said, you know what? All you old ladies have this wrong. 
we have to go for a federal amendment. And it really splintered the movement. And there were a lot of people who were conflicted about that. And these two factions of women fought over mindshare, resources, fundraising. They fought over political territory. And the president at that time, Woodrow Wilson, really hated Alice Paul because she was creating a lot of trouble for him politically. And he really sided with the other group of suffragists who he thought were much more manageable and they were they were playing nice. So when the 19th Amendment finally passed, the president invited all the other suffragists into the White House for a ceremony, but not Alice Paul. And so she was really kind of written out of the suffrage history because she was considered a bad girl. I think that's that's really the other main factor. And then the third reason is that Alice Paul was a really humble person really humble. And she never sought publicity for herself or recognition for the work that she did conceiving of the 19th Amendment and dragging it over the finish line. Well, you know, there's a lot of movement to reform our health care laws right now. Are there any obstacles in our health care laws to the better promotion of choice for women when it comes to giving birth? Are there any legal changes that would need to be made in order to make it easier for, for women to make use of, of midwives and doulas and have a birthing system that would be more similar to maybe what we have in Holland? Is it about legal liability? Is it about malpractice or is it about insurance reimbursement? What are the main legal changes? I think that there are, you know, there are, there are probably very meticulous changes that could be made to the way our laws are written and to legal liability and things like that. But I really think the bigger issue is culture change and understanding and dialogue. I mean, one of the biggest issues being discussed in maternity care today is racism and its effect on the maternal health of uh, women of color who end up with higher rates of morbidity and mortality for themselves and their babies in a way that doesn't cannot be explained away by physiology or, or anything else. It's the idea is that it's racism, not race. And, you know, solving for the high rates of terrible outcomes for women of color would go a long way toward reforming the whole system. Um, but it starts with listening to women believing women, and really making care woman-centered and not the indust not centered on the industrial medical complex, right? right. Not, not making things so that it's just easy for the hospital this way. And that, I don't know that laws can get at that. I think that this, this takes public dialogue. This takes, you know, more research. It takes training. It takes, you know, a, a change in the way doctors learn in medical school and what they're exposed to. And it also means we need different kinds of doctors and nurses and midwives, right? So yeah, it's it's a very complex system. And I think that I'm I'm so delighted to be talking to you about this because I think it's a conversation that we need to keep alive. And, you know, there's a new generation of moms out there probably grappling with all of this and hopefully a new generation of doctors and midwives as well who should all be asking questions every day as well. Yeah. And I think, although it's tempting to think of this as, you know, science versus a more holistic approach, I think it's really a question of new ideas in science. I think most of the things that advance the health of humans will be supported by science, of course, just where do these ideas come from? And ultimately, science that supports medicine has to come from other areas. And people have to understand the psychology. People have to understand sociology. I had a guest on last week who wrote a book called Born Anxious, and it was really all about the impact of, of anxiety on uh, lifelong outcomes, prenatal anxiety on lifetime outcomes. And it was really, you know, it's, he's a scientist, he's a psychologist, but in order to explore where this comes from, he had to understand, you know, politics and, and history and, and sociology and see, you know, why it is that, that women are exposed to so many things that create anxiety while while pregnant. And uh, so I think that it's, it's really about having a, a science that thinks more broadly, asks kind of different types of questions and is willing to, you know, listen to insight that comes from people that themselves may not be scientists. And I think that's what we're seeing in, in this field of obstetrics. Tina, thank you so much for joining me. It's really been enjoyable. I've enjoyed your book when I read it over 15 years ago, and, and it's, it's great to see that you're still 
thinking about these issues. And of course, Mr. President, how long must we wait in the middle of it right now? And I'm enjoying it immensely. So thank you so much. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.